Hello everybody. Welcome back to Read Aloud with Miss Godfrey. I'm so glad you're joining me today. Today is my birthday and so today is also the 16th and so in honor of that we're going to be reading chapter 16 and chapter 16 is from Capricorn Anderson's perspective. So we're going to read today and find out what's going on in his world and see what new things unfold in our Read Aloud of School. All right, here we go guys. It says, I knew something was wrong the minute I got off the bus and walked to the Donnelly's house. The Saturn was in the driveway, which meant that Mrs. Donnelly was home early. And the TV was off, even though TNT would be on in a few minutes. Sophie and her mom were in the kitchen. I heard Mrs. Donnelly's voice first. Oh, honey, don't feel bad. You know how he is. I hurried into the room. What happened? Is everything okay? An empty Dizani bottle missed my ear by inches. Get out of here, Sophie shrieked. Mind your own business. Sophie, her mother exclaimed in horror, you apologize to Cap. In answer, she leaped out of her chair and raced to the stairs. Mother, don't you dare tell the freakazoid anything about this. She pounded up to her bedroom and slammed the door. I looked at Mrs. Donnelly. What did I do? It was a silly question. What did I ever do? Nothing. And Sophie still treated me as if I'd crawled in from the septic tank. Please forgive Sophie, Mrs. Donnelly begged. She's just had some bad news. I was worried. Did something happen to Mr. Donnelly? Nothing that hasn't happened before, she sighed. He took off without so much as a goodbye. But, but what about the driving test? I protested. A license might have just been a piece of paper, but to Sophie, it meant everything. She shrugged. We'll have to just reschedule for when I can take her. My ex-husband is not a terrible person, but he doesn't see things through. He rolls into town, gets everybody's hopes up, and then he's gone until the next time when he does it all over again. I learned my lesson and got off that roller coaster, but my daughter, she has not figured it out yet. I felt terrible for Sophie. She was really crushed. Mr. Donnelly left town so suddenly that he hadn't even gotten her bracelet back from the engraver. Who knew she'd ever see it again? But of course, it was a lot more than losing a silver bangle that upset her. Life certainly gets complicated when you know more than one person. I could have only imagined what it would be like when I knew 1100. On Trigonometry and Tears, there was a character named Rishon who really bothered me. He didn't cheat on his girlfriend like Nick or spread computer viruses just for fun like Aurora. But his irresponsible, irresponsible behavior was almost impossible to bear. Sophie definitely did not agree. What do you care? It's a TV show. Her mood had been in free fall since Mr. Donnelly's departure. But if he doesn't take the ACT to bring up his score, the University of Florida is going to withdraw his acceptance, I exclaimed. She looked at me pityingly. So? He hasn't even started studying, and he overslept and missed the practice test. That's what they do on TNT, she explained. They take perfectly normal people and turn their lives into pond scum. That's why it's fun to watch. If everything was perfect, there'd be no story. But what's Rashawn going to do next year, I persisted. Probably find a part on a different show. He's an actor. Because, oh my gosh, there's a dog outside my window. Awkward. Because, probably find a different, or a part on a different show. Because he's an actor. Because Sophie had been watching TV her whole life, and not just a few weeks like me, it was easier for her to watch Rashawn throw his whole future away. For me, it was agony. Rain always said that when we judge others, we're really judging ourselves. That was the real reason Rashawn upset me. How could he think his SAT scores were going to go up by themselves? How could he ignore the fact that he was about to lose his spot to college? It was all too familiar. As 8th grade president, I was in charge of the Halloween dance, and I was giving it the Rashawn treatment. I was ignoring the whole thing, almost as if I thought it might go away. Then, on TNT, it all worked out for Rashawn. One of Aurora's viruses found its way into the admissions department computer at the University of Florida, wiping out half their records. All that were left indicated that Rashawn was accepted. He ignored the problem, and the problem just sort of melted away. With a growing sense of wonder, I realized that the same thing was happening with the dance. I was still doing nothing, yet somehow the arrangements were still being made. Students would come up to me in the hallway. They would sing along when I played guitar in the music room. They would join in my morning Tai Chi routine, and then they would volunteer to help. 
So many people were working on the party that I was beginning to think that we were actually going to have one. No wonder TNT was such a popular show. It was practically an instruction manual for my life. Garland Farm followed simple logic. You plant tomato seeds, you get tomato plants. No seeds, no tomatoes. Cause and effect. But a real school was so messy and random that solutions sometimes fell into place by sheer luck. It was almost like getting tomatoes without first planting seeds. I thought I would never get used to the outside world with its chaos and its clutter, but with millions of puzzle pieces being tossed up into the air, it really did stand to reason that the occasional one would come down in the right place. That's why Rashawn would go to college, and C. Average would have its Halloween dance. Even Rain would have to admit that there was something kind of impressive about that. Anderson, come over here. I need a word with you. The words jolted me out of deep meditation. I looked up to see Mr. Kasigi staring down at me. Why haven't you come to meet with me yet? I was floored. I did, the, the day that I registered here. Don't you play dumb with me, mister. I'm hearing talk of DJs and pizza ovens on wheels. How are you going to pay for all that? I don't have any money. He was getting red in the face. Nobody expects you to pay for it. The school has money set aside for the dance. But if you don't present your budget, I can't release one penny to you. I don't have a budget, I explained honestly. I just have people telling me, or I, excuse me, I just have people who help me do things. Like what? Fix your cuckoo clock? He launched into a long speech about how he had volunteered to be on the program committee for some principal's conference, so he didn't have time to nurse me through Finance 101, whatever that was. But it's all taken care of, I tried to tell him. The food, the music, the decorations, it's all worked out. I stopped myself before telling him about Rashawn. I had a feeling that Mr. Kasigi was not a TNT fan. And who's writing the checks, he demanded. Checks. Rain had a checkbook, but I never saw her touch it. Sometimes we use money to get along, she used to tell me, but that doesn't mean we have to become its slave. To Rain, financial matters were a distasteful but necessary private function. Kind of like going to the bathroom. Mr. Kasigi said I would, ha I would have to write checks. Not only that, but he would have to co-sign them or they wouldn't count. After school, he drove me to the bank. I'd never been in a bank before, but the instant I stepped inside, I knew this place was a place that represented everything Rain and I were rejecting by living at Garland. Money was all that was important here. People were depositing it, withdrawing it, borrowing it, and paying it back. They were counting it out in broad daylight. I honestly felt like running away. But how could I? For one thing, there was a man in uniform guarding the door. I practically jumped out of my skin when I realized that he had a big old gun strapped to his hip. Mr. Kasigi noticed my reaction. Calm down, Anderson. He's a security security officer, not a, not a bank robber. Every time I thought I was fitting into my temporary life, something would remind me just how much of an outsider I still was. I wanted less than nothing of what this place had to offer. But to people outside of Garland, money was so desirable that the bank had to hire armed guards to keep criminals from stealing it. When I finally got back home, I was going to drop to my knees and kiss the ground. Mr. Kasigi and I met with an assistant manager, and when it was all over, I was holding a book of checks marked Claveridge Middle School Student Activity Fund. You'll need these to pay for music and food, he explained, signing the first 12 checks in the spot, and I'm sure there'll be other expenses that come up. They always do. I tried to tell him that I didn't know the DJ or the pizza company that the other students had made the arrangements, but he interrupted me with this long lecture about how his money or about how this money belonged to everybody, not just me and how I had to be responsible. And I would have been if I had the slightest idea what he was talking about. All I wanted was for him to leave so I could get out of this awful place. I wouldn't even let him drive me to the Donnellys. I needed to walk there in the fresh air just to get the smell of banking out of my nostrils. A few blocks down the street, a sight met my eyes that stopped me in my tracks. There, in the display window of a small jewelry shop, gleamed a silver bangle with multicolored stones. It was exactly the same as Sophie's birthday gift from her father, the one he had taken for engraving and never brought back. I stepped into the store for a closer look. It was beautiful, but also kind of sad, because it reminded me of how upset Sophie had been lately. The idea came immediately. If I bought this bracelet and had it engraved and sent it to Sophie, she would never know that it hadn't came from her father, and it would make her so happy. But I didn't have any money. But I did have something even better. Checks, which automatically counted as 
money, as much money as you wrote in that little box. It probably wasn't what Mr. Kasigi had in mind, but I remembered his exact words, be responsible. Rain always said that nothing was more responsible than doing what was in your power to make another human being happy. happy. I'll take it, I told the woman behind the counter. It's $175, she said, kind of wary. Do you accept checks? Uh-oh, that is the end of chapter 16. So Cap is going to take, oh, we can only guess, but Cap is going to take his checks from the school that are meant to pay for the school dance and buy a bracelet for Sophie. Do you all see this going somewhere good? I don't. Let's see what happens. Tune in tomorrow. I promise I'll be here. We'll read chapter 17 of Schooled, and we will move right along. Thanks for joining me, guys, for Read Aloud with Miss Godfrey, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.